founder and CEO of Her Story. I want to say a, a big happy Father's Day to all the dads out there and the daughters and sons celebrating. I hope you're having a magical day. Uh, I know the sun is shining for you all. Um, so I think what I'll do is to start the event today, I'm just going to read the article that I wrote this week for the Irish Independent, which gives you, I suppose, the context as to why we are doing this event. And um, it's going to be a big theme for her story going forward into the future. So without further ado, to celebrate Father's Day, her story honors the dads who have empowered their daughters throughout the centuries and her story's godfathers who have played a pivotal role in co-creating the Irish her story movement. Long before man walked on the moon, a lunar crater was named in honor of Cork woman and 19th century pioneering astronomer, Agnes Mary Clerk. It was her father who nurtured her childhood curiosity in the stars, teaching her the basics of astronomy and lending his telescope to explore the night sky. In the same era, aspiring young naturalist Mary Ward collected insects and studied them under her father's magnifying glass, recording the specimens in intricate drawings. When she was a teenager, her father gifted her one of the finest microscopes in Ireland at the time, leading to a lifelong passion and esteemed scientific career. In the 18th century, the young Maria Edgeworth received a diverse education from her father on subjects such as law, economics, science and politics. Later, she worked as her father's assistant in estate management and the father-daughter duo collaborated on a series of educational books for children. Dubliner Una Kyo became the first female stockbroker in the world when her father nominated her to the Irish Stock Exchange in 1925. As Dr. Angela Byrne explained, no stock exchange had ever had a woman working in one before, and the suggestion was not completely accepted, but Ireland had a new constitution which guaranteed equality, and there was no reason to reject Kyo except for her gender. History is full of feminist fathers who backed their daughters' dreams and rewrote the gender rule book, challenging the patriarchal structures of their time. Looking back at my own personal childhood, it's an anomaly that I found in her story. Growing up in our family, there was no question that women were equal to men. To be honest, feminism, feminism wasn't even on my radar. I never felt that my gender was a disadvantage. My father had a formative influence on me, gifting my love of music, nature, philosophy and meditation. When I was a nipper, he would bring me on epic hikes and island escapades to birdwatch and hunt for fossils. Education was absolutely paramount and he shaped my worldview with the National Geographic, David Attenborough documentaries and Disney animations. I'm the eldest of five and I have three strong spirited sisters. I confess my only brother, who was six years my junior, was an outspoken feminist long before me. My rose-tinted glasses were shattered when I discovered countless lost and overlooked women's stories leading to the creation of her story. I became an angry feminist overnight and a new laser-sharp feminist lens made it impossible to avoid the subtle and explicit sexism absolutely everywhere. A turning point occurred when I caught myself projecting my newly awakened feminist rage on the men in my life. In that moment, I held a mirror up to myself and the realization dawned. It's unfair and quite absurd to project thousands of years of suppressed collective wrath against the patriarchy onto modern men, especially the men who had supported and empowered me. So I began a process of rethinking my relationship to anger. There's big energy in this formidable emotion. It's empowering stuff. It's also potentially explosive and highly unpredictable. As a catalyst, it's the tipping point emotion. So it can be used to disrupt or construct. So I decided to wield and alchemize my anger to create an inclusive and compassionate feminist movement. And a beautiful thing happened when my perspective shifted from fury to compassion. Anger had previously blinded me from some liberating insights. And one night I was immersed in fascinating women's biographies when I spotted a trend. In nearly every remarkable woman's biography, there's at least one man who saw her as an equal and championed her talents. They were fathers, brothers, husbands, sons, teachers, and friends. In the depths of patriarchal suppression, there are heartening examples of equality throughout history in today's culture. Evidence that equality is not only possible, but realistic. This insight is the inspiration behind a very big future Her Story project coming hopefully next year. 
And to be honest, I delight in how my assumptions have been challenged one by one. At the beginning, I honestly believed her story's greatest champions would be women. Today, her story has as many godfathers as godmothers, supported by godfathers who have created portraits, penned biographies, opened doors, forged partnerships and funded projects. In, nine, in 2019, Anton Ishta, Simon Coveney closed his speech to the United Nations with the affirming statement, history needs her story. It is not only the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. On the contrary, I've experienced more toxic femininity than toxic masculinity. Shadow exists throughout the gender spectrum, especially when polarities are stretched to breaking points. The truth is both sexes have suffered at the hands of the patriarchy. As a woman, I cannot begin to imagine being forced to conscript, trained to kill and sent to war. They say that history is written by the victors, but there's no victory in creating trauma that torments generations. Humanity is still recovering from the wars of the last century and beyond. My question is how can men and women collectively heal together from the trauma of the patriarchy? In the pandemic, there's a sense we are on the precipice of a new world. Human doings have been forced to become human beings again. During the pause, the cracks appeared and the blind spots became obvious. We live in triggering times. And in this liminal space, our ability to process and alchemize anger will determine the trajectory of humanity. As we move beyond the old paradigm that is naturally de deconstructing, accelerated by the coronavirus. There's an opportunity to reimagine gender and rewrite the future. What if the war of the sexes became a dance to equality? So lots to reflect on in that article. Um, it's gonna be, like I said, a big theme going forward for her story. Um, so what I wanna do next is I'm gonna, um, I'm going to show you some of the wonderful artworks created by Her Story's Godfathers, The Illuminations, a beautiful slideshow that I prepared, especially for this event. Nice. Bear with me now, I find the, the button. The buttons are in different places to, to zoom, so. Just gonna find the right spot. Okay, so first I'm gonna introduce you to the men in my family who have championed me. This is my dad here and my three little siblings. Well, two little siblings and me. And um, yeah, very very much growing up in our house, there was no question that women were equal to men. Um, and that was, I suppose, very much my both my parents' influence. My mother's line in particular, very, very strong um, feminist line. My great-grandfather um, was a dairyman. Great place to find her. Uh, a feminist husband if you're ever looking their dairy men are like going back centuries actually renowned feminists it's a it's a cultural hotspot um for feminism so this is my dad and my, my my sister jessica who's based in australia taken a few years ago and here we are the three of us and you can see my little brother on the right hand side a budding feminist to be and he was an outright feminist long before me he made this point to me when i saw him two weeks ago <laughs> reminded me of the fact uh six years my junior he's a beautiful sensitive soul um extraordinary wisdom probably the wisest in our family actually um yeah and staunch feminist very proud of him. my grandfather had a big influence on me too uh he was a very beautiful gentle kind being um he instilled in me in a love for stamp collecting when i was a little girl so i'd sit up on his knee and stamp collect for hours and he'd tell me about all the different countries around the world and he died when i was 11 and i was just so heartbroken i have hardly opened the stamp the stamp collection book since but it's it's in my library behind me. Um, and here we are with my granddad. He was just such a sweet, like gentle, he was like an angel. Beautiful, gentle presence. Very, very shy and brilliant with kids. Like we really adored him. Uh, here we are, the three of us together with him. And this is my uncle, who's one of my great heroes. Um, an amazing father to four children. Brilliant at his job. All around nice guy, genuinely wonderful turns up in my life when I really need just the, the perfect nugget of wisdom, always present, always timely, always spot on. 
um, I have huge respect for him. Like that, he has three older sisters. My mum is actually his godmother. And he's a formidable, formidable mother too. So my grandmother um, was the first, was the second woman in, in its high to keep her job actually when she got married, which was unheard of at the time. But there was just no question about it. You know, she was a formidably brilliant woman and not long retired um, too. So yeah, she's quite a, a force of nature. And I, I mean, looking back on the, on, I suppose the father figures in my life, I, um, I went to a wonderful school called Wisdom's Hospital and my, I had three amazing male teachers um, for my leaving cert. This, this gentleman here on the left-hand side is Dr. David Grubb. He was my applied maths and physics teacher. He would resuscitate the physics curriculum, breathe life into it, analogy after analogy. He just brought the subject to life, which isn't hard. Physics is fascinating, but the curriculum is terribly dry. Um, and we debunked the myth actually in school that physics and applied maths um, were male subjects. There was actually four girls in our physics class and two guys and I was the only student in the applied maths class. Um, my, my pure maths teacher, Andrew's maths teacher, was a wonderful soul as well and I had an incredible English teacher who very much pushed and challenged my thinking and um, I suppose he's a big influence for my writing these days. Um, so when her story started it was a little seedling and I shared the, the inspiration with a dear friend of mine, Zabaj Carico. He was my art director when I worked in Paris in um, Fred and Farid, one of the top advertising agencies there, and he disappeared, went quiet, and the next thing you know, these two aviators landed in my inbox. He spent five days on each one. The detail is absolutely extraordinary. On the left-hand side, there's Lillian Bland. She was the first woman, or one of the first women in the world, to design, build, and fly her own aircraft. Her father actually was a great champion of her too, now that I, now that I recall, and she performed that feat on Carmody Hill and County, and, Lit and Amelia Hart was only 12 years old at the time, would you believe? And on the right hand side, we have Lady Mary Heath, who was the first person, man or woman in the world, to fly the length of Africa. Um, and she performed this feat in an open air cockpit, as you do with her um, fur coats and her silk skir skirts and her tennis racket and her poetry book. She was a great, great character. So, the wonderful thing happened then. Um, we pitched the idea to create um, a women's exhibition, the first ever women's exhibition for the Irish Embassy Network and there was no nepotism whatsoever but um, the Department of Foreign Affairs actually unanimously chose Zabaj, everybody, the whole team chose Zabaj to create the illustrations. So his artworks are, artworks are now touring around the world for the next five years. They've been at the United Nations headquarters in New York and the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. So I'm very proud of him and it's just wonderful to work with such a beautiful sweet soul who's probably a more fierce feminist than I am. Um, and these are the beautiful illustrations that he created, so it was really gorgeous. And fair play, I mean, to John McCullough, who commissioned the exhibition in the Department of Foreign Affairs. We initially pitched the idea to do a suffrage centenary um, exhibition. He said, no, I want you to think much bigger. I want to include the women from all the different fields, from sport, to art, to science, to politics, humanitarian work, of course, being a big focus for the UN and, 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 and uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs. And it's wonderful to see that we want to see a temporary seat at the, the UN uh, Security Council this week. So, Ava Gore Booth, big favourite of President Michael D. Higgins. So I asked about to focus on this illustration first and he had it ready in time for the first ever women's caucus. Um, Ireland hosted the event and there were female politicians from all around the world and 43 countries were represented and President Higgins hosted a gala banquet so we did beautiful projections onto Dublin Castle and lit up Ava Booth. and as a thank you I got a big bear hug from our president who gives he gives the best bear hugs and this is myself and Zazu outside the GPO with Ava. Uh, there they are again, um, the wonderful epic letters. Um, to be honest, the Blazing a Trail exhibition and all of the RT productions that we did, the TV series and the podcast animations, none of this would have, been ha would have happened without the support of Mervyn Green and Neville Isdell, the co-founders of Epic Museum. Um, they have been our partners, our co-creators, her stories, original godfathers. Mervyn has been a brilliant advisor to the project. I'm forever grateful for his support. So 
um, it was really special. We did a beautiful launch event for the TV series there on the night um, back in January. And uh, I'm looking forward to collaborating with Epic again in the future. Sean Brannigan from Storyboard Workshop created um, a series of beautiful illustrations. Um, I sent the challenge of, well, Grace was one of the women on the list. Funny story, um, Grace actually, well, my grand uncle's uncle was Joseph Mary Plunkett. So I'm related somewhat to Grace, not through bloodline, but through marriage. And my grand uncle would sit down with us as kids and he would tell us stories of the 1916 rising. I think he was out to radicalize me, which wouldn't be too hard. And uh, so when I asked um, Sean about Grace, he said, she's one of my favorites, great hair with the 1916 rising. But I said, Sean, really, you know, she should be a joker if you're going to do a playing card because she was a satirical cartoonist. And um, during the Civil War, Sinn Féin, um, they hired her to create their satirical um, propaganda posters. And for her involvement in the Civil War, she was locked up in Kilmainham jail and she doodled all over <laughs> her prison walls to pass the time. So I, I, I mean, I was adamant that she should be the joker, but... Sean replied, he insisted absolutely that she was very much queen, great queen of the 1916 rising, and not just the, the tragic bride that she's portrayed as. So Sean created the League of Heroines poster. And I remember meeting the fifth class students at um, Skull Breeja in Blanchardstown. And the first thing they said to me was, when are the League of Heroines going to be animated into a series? So that's one of our future, future dreams if it happens. Um, that would be really incredible. And then that's Lady Mary Heath, always a great favourite. No, this is not Amelia Hart, this is an Irish aviator. And Sean's wonderful wife, the ever talented Amy DeVroon, who was a playwright, poet, um, actress, writer, you name it. Amy wrote a brilliant play called I See You about. Lady Mary Heath, so we, she performed actually a piece of the play for the RT nine o'clock news on the first Her Story Light Show um, festival, and that's her husband's artwork projected behind her. So it's a little story behind the pictures. And then Sean, had actually, you can see here, he created the Bridget, uh, Ninja Bridget, as I call her, for the League of Heroines. So I said, for Bridget's sake this year, Sean, we have to light her up in Dublin. So here she is a playing card and we limited her on Kildare Cathedral and the GPO, isn't she rocking? Um, so another huge supporter of, of her story, who's one of our speakers tonight, is the legendary Jim Fitzpatrick. This is the first ever actual light show that we did. It was the launch event for the 2017 inaugural light festival on the Hill of Ishnock, which is the ancient sacred feminine centre of Ireland. It was the epicentre in in a pre-Celtic times, um, actually more significant than the Hill of Tyre. It's a fabulous place to go. Very ambitious to light up the Catstone though. It's a glacial erratic rock, but there was a serendipitous moment where somebody just picked up a barrel on and we caught Eru's face and isn't she just magical? And then in 2018, it was the suffered centenary year. So we decided to light up Markovich um, and all of the suffragettes who smashed the windows on the buildings. 100 years ago, we projected them all across the city and made the six o'clock news headlines. This is Mary Magdalene that Jim did a special um, request to campaign for the justice for the, the Magdalene Laundry survivors. So we projected the beautiful artwork that Jim did onto the Magdalene Laundry in Sean McDermott Street. And Bowan, the river goddess, one of the three founding goddess myths of Ireland. And then on a whim last winter, as you do, in the middle of winter, you decide to go and film a, sh a, um, a light projection um, shoot on a beach in the, in the driving sleet and rain. Here is Patsy Preston on the left-hand side and Enda Donnelly, good friends of mine. And we did projections onto the Barons and the cliffs and caves in Mahermore Beach, County Wicklow. That's a flame actually in the middle of the cave that you can see there. This is Airy by Jim. And this is the, oh, I'm trying to remember her name now. She's the mother goddess, I think, the earth goddess by Courtney Davis, who's also another her story god for his, his, his work is really, really powerful. And um, I'm so grateful for his contribution too. So this year we 
he said, we said, Jim, the challenge, we said, Jim, you have to do Bridget because he's never done Bridget before, would you believe? Ireland's matron saint and triple goddess. And uh, we had a big conversation about how we'd represent her. And they said, really for our times, it's about equality. And she was a triple archetypal goddess, um, synonymous with the elements of fire being the masculine and water being the feminine. So here she is in perfect balance, the fire being mystical blue and the water being well naturally blue. <laughs> um, it's very, it's a very powerful image. Um, and we projected it onto the GPO on Bridget's Day, which is, yeah, it's really stunning. Um, and we've also been illuminating the artworks um, by Bill Felton, actually a contemporary of Jim Fitzpatrick. They worked together in the early days, the Mad Men days in the Irish advertising industry. Um, Bill has created stunning art as well of lost mythic goddesses. Actually, there are three men, three brilliant male artists who have been doing Trojan work for decades to reawaken the lost goddess cultures of the Tula Dan and, and the Celtic cultures. And they are Courtney Davis, Jim Fitzpatrick and Bill Felton. So a huge thank you to our feminist forefathers for your, for your, um, your work in lighting the feminine flame. This is Fumnock. We focus on, on this for this slideshow, we focus on women who are not part of the, the, the cultural mythic canon. They're not mainstream, but um, if you want to go onto bardmythologies.com, you can read all their stories. Just, and we also have the stories featured on the Her Story website too, thanks to Bard and their, their wonderful support. This is Aideen, Eten, and Masbukala, projected onto Trinity College Dublin. And this is the work of Courtney Davis. Like I said, um, Courtney has been a big supporter of her story since the first year. Um, he, he represents the mother maiden and crone in his work. Um, his work, they're like portals. They're just very, very powerful. I'd highly recommend visiting his studio on the Hill of Tara. Um, you can see all his work there by Prince. It's, yeah, it's a really special experience. So this is Courtney's work here. And then we projected his work on, this is the Kildare, Kildare Cathedral. And this is called Transition, this piece. It's absolutely stunning. And all of these beautiful images that I've just shown you, all of the light shows, um, are the work of Dodeca, Jeff and Sharon and the team at Dodeca, who have been absolute trailblazers for us, really huge Her Story supporters, and very much the godfathers in Her Story too. Jeff Fitzpatrick is the, is the owner of Dodeca, and he gives us his his projectors anytime we want to do a light show it's his giving back piece he's got young daughters and he's such a feminist and a great dad and I, what I love about going to meetings at Dodeca actually is that the men know more about the myth the goddesses than the women and they're teaching the women in the room myself and Sharon about the goddesses like it's just some great feminist men Callum Jeff Jeff and Jeff <laughs> And Sharon too. So they are their picture. They got to meet President Higgins when we did the light show in Dublin Castle, which is really special. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker. The fabulous Caitlin Hanna, who is my right hand woman. She is Her Story's in-house researcher and project manager, and she has been doing fabulous work researching um father and daughter duos and uh historic historic fathers contemporary fathers and she's written a fabulous photo essay as well um which is on the her story website but i'm going to let her speak now about some of the stories that she's found so over to you caitlin hi can you hear me yeah i can hear you perfectly yeah i have a little powerpoint so bear with me while i see if it works <laughs> It's a share screen button, and then I think it's yeah. the second button if you click on it. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to see it? Let's see. I think it's loading. Lovely. You're off. You can see it? Yep. Perfect. Can you see me? I can see you perfectly. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So um, Mel's talked a bit about some of the women already. Um, she talked about them when she was um, reading out her independent piece, but um, I, I'll go over them again. For the, I know there's people kind of joining us a bit late. So the first one is Mary Ward, and she was born in 1827 to Henry King and Harriet Lloyd in Offaly. 
And from a very young age, she collected insects and she used her father's magnifying glass to study them and to draw them in really, really minute detail. Um, and then when she was a bit older in her teens, this uh, man called James, he was part of the Astronomical Society of London. He came across her and saw the work she was doing and he tried to persuade her dad then to get her a microscope. And her dad did get her microscope and it was reportedly one of the finest in Ireland at the time. And so this really kind of spurred her on and microscopy became her life's interest then. And so that's obviously an image there of her um, on the left. And on the right is an illustration by Adrian Gagan. We did a project earlier this year on a few women and girls in science and the environment and things like that. So Mary Ward was one of the women that we focused on. So that image is by Adrian Gagan. So then the next woman is Agnes Mary Clerk, um, who was born in 1842 in Cork. And her father, John William Clerk, taught her the basics of astronomy. And so she grew up then using his telescope for her observations. And she actually has a crater on the moon named after her because she played such a, a brilliant role in bringing astronomy and astrophysics to the public in England. So she's really special as well, um, that she has she has the crater on the moon named after her. Una Kyo then um, is one of the women that we focused on in our recent TV series. She was born in 1903 in Dublin. And after spending a few years studying and traveling around uh, Europe and, and beyond that, she was offered a job in stockbroking from her father, who had his own company. And he, in his own right, was kind of one of the youngest uh, bank managers when he got that role in the 1880s. So he offered her the job. And as Dr. Angela Byrne, she's kind of focused a lot on Una, on Una and did a lot of the research for the TV series. She says that no stock exchange had ever had a woman working in one before. But Ireland had a new constitution which guaranteed equality. And there was no reason to reject Una um, except for her gender. So with her education and wealth, she was fully qualified for the role. So eventually she did get the role and uh, like she came up across um, a lot of difficulties even so, but she was the first woman. And I don't think there was another woman um, admitted onto the stock exchange for another 40 plus years. So it was a really big feat. And that illustration there on the screen is by Lauren O'Neill and um, that we had commissioned as well. Maria Edgeworth then was born in 1768 in England, but she moved to Edgeworthstown in Longford with her dad, um, Richard, in about 1773. This was after the death of her own mother and when her father remarried. So from a very young age, she had been educated on topics that included law, economics, science, politics, all by her dad, who, who taught her this when she was growing up. And then when she got into her later life, um, she worked alongside her dad as both his assistant in estate management and as a collaborator on a series of educational books for children. So she was actually, she was really significant in the evolution of the novel in England. So her dad, again, being a big influence in her, in her life. And then Malala is, you know, more recently obvious, uh, obviously Malala, um, born in Pakistan in 1997. And her dad was, uh, he ran a girls' school in their village. So he has always, um, a big influence in her young life and encouraging her to you know be as educated as her brothers and things like that which was um not the most I mean as she said herself girls you know they're not the uh they're not exactly wanted in Pakistan as much as the boys are so when the Taliban then took over they didn't allow girls to go to school anymore and Malala then began to speak out on behalf of girls and their right to learn but of course, this made her a target. And in 2012, a masked gunman boarded her school bus and shot her in the head. Um, luckily, she recovered from that and her family relocated to England. And her and her dad founded the Malala Fund, which is a charity dedicated to giving every girl an opportunity to achieve the future she chooses. And in December 2014, then she was actually awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And as I'm sure everybody has seen just there very recently in the past few days, she's actually graduated now. So She's doing brilliant and her dad is such an influence in her life. Razan then is one of the women that we've kind of been champion um, on her street recently. Um, amazing person. She's a Surrey and Irish journalist. And she uh, we reached out to a few different people at, to ask them how has their dads influenced them in their life coming up to Father's Day. And she, you know, told us that she had two teachers as parents, her mum and her dad, 
And according to her, her dad is so pro-women and he never tried to restrict her growing up. Um, Roseanne moved to Ireland in 2011 uh, to study and she was never able to return home because the conflict is very escalated. And she's only seen her parents, I think, once since then. They were able to visit just once. And to her dad, Roseanne wanted to, to say, Daddy, although 4,110 kilometers is between us and I have not seen you in five years, you're present in every step of my life. And these women um, and these stories, they're all kind of included in that photo essay that Melanie talked about. Um, Roseanne included a lot more than what I had here, but um, a few different sayings and things that she carries with her that her dad has ta taught her throughout her life. So you can see all those photo essays uh, in our photo essay and some of our other speakers here. Uh, Jim Fitzpatrick being one and um, they've included we've included their little stories as well in that photo essay and some really amazing photos and things so you can see that on our website at the minute and then hi dad um, I know Melanie wanted me to say, say a few things about my own dad and um, which again I included in the um, in the photo essay my dad has been a brilliant influence in my life as well uh, growing up he always used to call me his scholar um, and when I come home from school, he'd say, how's my scholar today? And things like that. And even still today, he's um, a great influence in that, you know, if he sees um, a magazine or a book or an article on Facebook about women's history or anything like that, he'll always tag me in it or buy it for me. The other day, literally a few days ago, brought me home um, one of the Irish magazines with Coming a Man on the front. So he wanted to show it to me. So he's been great that sort of way. And um, I've come to realize now that I'm grown up, you know, that it's lovely to actually become friends with your parents. And lucky enough for me as well, my grandparents are um, still around that, you, you know, we can share a bottle of wine or we can try new food when we go on holidays and stuff like that. So I'm really enjoying that. Um, being able to be friends with my dad and with my mom um, and everybody like that. So I'm really enjoying that. And then I also wanted to mention, I think I have some more time. <laughs> I wanted yeah. to mention just a bit about my granddads as well, because I have great influence from them as well. So this is my granda Hannah, my dad's dad, and he loves to dance. And, you know, obviously you love your grandparents growing up, but I really feel in the past years that me and my granda have really bonded. Um, so he loves to waltz and we're always waltzing. And there the other day in the bottom right, you can see, this is just a few days ago that we I was allowed to go inside and see him close closer than usual and oh. um, so we had a socially distanced dance um so we couldn't really get any closer than we are in that picture there but we were dancing kind of apart but together still so it was lovely because it's the first time that we kind of had any sort of a dance since Christmas so he's a great influence as well and mm. I love him to bits <laughs> and then um my granda my granda Tommy that's my mom's dad um I actually never got to meet him because he died in 1983, uh, long before I was born. But uh, mm -hmm. mom always tells me that I would have got on so well with him, that he you know, loved history, was a great storyteller, um, and that you know, she sees a lot of similarities between us and things like that. And when he died, my mom, I think, was only 21 or so. And she used to have a lot of nightmares you know, going on from that just missing her dad and things I think and on the eve of my first birthday she had this dream and she describes it as you know the scene in Moses you know where the water parts and there was all these people walking forwards and she held she was holding me in her arms and she saw all these people walking and she saw her dad up ahead and she called out to him and he turned around and came over to her and took me in his arms and gave me a little kiss on the cheek and then gave me back to her and walked them through the waves you know, in the parted waves, whatever. So she, ever since then, she's never had a nightmare um, of him. So I feel a, a really close connection to him, um, even though I never met him. So that's all my little influences. They've all been, I've had been very lucky, uh, very lucky with all the, the men in my life, so. <laughs> wow, thank you, Kate. I've never heard the stories about your grandfathers before. Yeah. That's stunning. Thank you for sharing, yeah. sweet soul. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great slideshow. And thanks for your fantastic work. And um, we must share actually again the we'll drop it into the comments on the on the YouTube mm -hmm. um, video. Peyton has written a God, it's a it's a roller coaster read of a, a photo essay about all the different yeah. 
pictures and it's a photo essay as well so there's lots of gorgeous pictures on the too yeah. so well done you've been doing trojan work behind the scenes and all the social media you're a star <laughs> okay so on to our next speaker i'm looking forward to introducing the wonderful john ennis so john is a poet from westmeath my home county he won the patrick Kavanagh poetry award in 1975 and the list will open poetry competition 11 times seamus heaney said john is ireland's most undeservedly neglected poet he has been a her story godfather and advisor since the beginning and we are so grateful for your support and wisdom john He's going to be reading a few poems, one about the birth of his daughter, Thrace, and one on the birth of his daughter, or her daughter rather, his granddaughter, Lucy, and one about Mullingar author, Josephine Hart. Um, I haven't heard this poem before, and she's a big inspir inspiration for her story, so I'm looking forward to talking to John. John, how are you? Happy Father's Day. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Melanie. Hi, see you. Yeah, good to see you as well, and uh, hi, Kathleen, as well. Yeah. Are you having a nice Father's Day? Oh, very nice. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, lots of calls. Did you spend some time with your sorry, your son and your grandchildren as well? One of my sons with me here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Need to help with technical issues, if there are any. Hopefully not. No, no, no. Fine, yeah. Great. Okay, John, so tell me, why did you get involved in her story? Sorry, uh, yeah. Um, mm. Chance first to share my few thoughts on Melanie's grandchild, her story. I first became aware of her story when I read an interview with Mead Arts Officer Miriam Mulrennan had with Melanie for those Mead examiner way back in 2016. The article concluded with Melanie's um, mobile, which I phoned as the Embryo Project, interested me. Mm. The rediscovery of Irish women, either largely forgotten in our brainwash from the National Society as well as a new need for self-empowerment of women still denied basic rights in our society. As it happened, there were also the concerns of a book I was then writing, Euridice 29, is it here? And um, that was published, duly published in late 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, I met Melanie and she was persuasive. Uh, I offered the proceeds of the sales of my book to help lift off her story. Eurydice, 29, by the title. Eurydice herself has survived for thousands of years in the male shadow of the legendary Orpheus. Mm. In my Eurydice's musical voice is dominant. Orpheus has not a note in his head. Eurydice at 29, she never ages. She is the eternal feminine. Mm. As regards my work life, I worked as head of humanities and Waterford Institute of Technology and gender balance and leadership and management roles for course directors became a core concern of mine in my later years in school. I achieved a 53% gender balance before my retirement in 2009, the 3% extra going to women. In our place out at uh, Nahin, and the wife, uh, and I wanted all our kids, we wanted all our kids to achieve their potential. And theirs was the unfettered freedom to decide their futures. We stressed with them in education was key to realising their dreams. Our eldest daughter, Tres, is giving her own independent take on this. The first poem I read is called The Birth of Lucy. That's the third child of Tres and Adrian out in Faha. Up in Westmead, myself, I've been waiting for news of the birth all day, watching movies in the early January night. When the news arrived, and then the poem. The poem refers to florist Sheefins in Mullingar. <coughs> So, on the birth of Lucy. For Trays on Lucy, 16th of January 2014. The lone hawthorn, they're silhouetted in nocturnal fields, and there's a full moon tonight, its face well haloed in the mist. Eighteen hours now since Adrian called you Lucy, forcing your way down and out into daybreak. Your mother, exhausted, sleeps in 18 postnatal. After you, and the customary first day of visitors who, and who she like, pat her on, greet the post feeder face. Yourself unique in the cot beside your bed. At odds and chores all day way up midland country, I take a walk alone round mile midnight on the glowing coals, the crossing master and commander down, and three full glasses walk the heady avenue, where all the tall trees 
with all the tall trees, for each one's taller than the other. A few I fear they may yet crash down by dint of storm, yet so interlinked with their branches and their boughs, gales will have a tough time of it, if gales have a mind to ever felling them. So I yearn, may it be so with you, Lucy, for whom on the morrow and trays I bring flowers, and to nets and chiefins. Salute two brave souls, nine months over, as I walk back, top up, what's in the ashy stove, right of you with love. So poem for Lucy. Um, the next poem then, um, we move back to Waterford, and the poem Birth at Airmount in the book Dolman Hill, um, that was published um, way, way back. It's in the 1970s. Airmount is at the top of the city and was maternity hospital then. The occasion is the birth of our first daughter, Therese herself. The poem takes place on the interval between Anne's leaving her bed to go to the delivery ward and the birth, with me waiting by a window looking down over the city. This poem was written to order, to thank all the staff involved in any way with Anne's safe delivery. Gertie Cody live just down from Airmount. Further down, Joe and Amelda Bulger, lovely people in the Glen. I lodged with them when I first arrived in Orr. <clears throat> Bertha Dearmount, Fran. You've left me now. Hot foot, I'm, stole today. I'm told to stay put. From your second floor maternity window, I see and do not see silence brooding across old corporation houses, smoky chimney pot, 2nd of June, Congress Place. Catalyst, the hose marked at High Valley Brickin. Straggle of summer lovers past the Dole House to Regina. Two French ships anchoring on the Placid Shore at 7.30. Mooring ropes of the cargo vessels dropping over bollards. Woodcocks coo gently buoyant in thinly graying bluish clouds. Down in the glen, Amelda Boulders calling her to Elston. Squabbles, terrace roofs adds for orange fiberglass, hardly insulate. The aging youth men unemployed with sun and ankle. Marriages on the verge, daughters out for a glass, craftsmen, most settling for young apprentices. Hearts trust all in tomorrow here and the IDA. Mm -hmm. Woodcock and its twilight over gardens are hanging in delicate imbalance. A magnolia blooms across from Cody's. Love assortment of voices, if love means to feed, clothe, see red, soothe the toothache when the black licorice hits the nerve. Love rummaging the minor memorabilia of a summer's day, squads of after supper threes to tens to seventeens on chalk pavements. No ground for sport, bed, kitchen. Mothers try to guess family when calls on the morning, facing a big table. The sun was loitering in the east, that terrible sun they attempted its first frail kicks in your womb. The minutes are taking their deadly time. One o'clock on, I've watched anatomy of pain, drip, pithidine, blood oozing. My palms polished with a constant friction shine like the corridor's parquet flooring. Tidy small of your backs an old washing board. Venus a shorn mound of swollen rending flesh. Cries like raw bile topped up your silky throat. Minute by minute savagery. Verse is a cold travesty. Did force you. Duped in a wheelchair, you are whisked to the livery couch. I'm ready. On a hospital cherry, a blackbird blossoms into late June. Congress place intrudes, swells, ebbs round your June bed, 7.40 p.m. If to your expulsive travail my ears a fetal stethoscope, I praise those, Coretti with Ergometrin, who must hourly cope. Manula, Barbara, Eileen, Joan, Kathleen, thanks. Gallagher, the doctor, easing the baby out safely, thanks. Miss Egghead, in an inkling, sits on your diaphragm, to whom I'm a blur or nothing at all, she swaddled, warm to touch. If I say she has my dead father's face, who knows? You is truly of all that agony bears not a trace. Mm. With the last poem, then uh, we move back to West Needs again. Um, last poem is entitled Live Life Magnificently. Mm. And the poem to honour a deceased writer from Mullingar, Josephine Hart. Mm. And the motto of the title, She Lived By. Mm. Josephine herself survived a traumatic adolescence with family loss. I shared a seat in St. Mary's CBS with her brother Owen for a year. 
His name occurs in the poem as does that of her partner, Morris Setchie. Largely self-educated, Josephine was obsessed in her work with the twin forces of existence, Eros, love, and Fanatus, death. Her devotion to Eros and her refusal ever to party with death. This poem concludes my selected poems 2000-2020 due out from Book Hub at the right later uh, this summer. <clears throat> um, that is the um, uh, a rough of the um, cover of the um, collective. Congratulations, John. Sorry? Congratulations. Oh. I'm looking forward to getting a copy. Yeah, look at uh, the, uh, oh yes, the pipe then, um, the, the uh, almost life magnificently in a Morian Josephine mm -hmm. article. Where others chose Thanatos, you chose Eros. Even in your cancer days, primary, Eric Daniel. Mm -hmm. But you were crucible at an early age by loss. Charles, Sheila, Owen, each snuffed out like a Christmas candle. You survived adolescence with climactic will. Eros was your god, which might explain then the extremes of Morris you loved, breakfasting by your bone, setting your place at table, odd behaviour by our Thanatos standards. Your lives only halved. Black and white, that's how it goes, your colours seem to say. Bear your teeth against the void, and those red, red lips of yours pout rage, rage against the dying of your day. Stare gorgons in the eye, know them to the fingertips. Voices that transcend the edge you really loved. Poetry, a warehouse where gods are moved. Jim, will wow. So powerful, John. So thank you very much. To our local heroine. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, yeah, spellbinding as always. Really wonderful. And the, and, the, and the poems about your granddaughter and your daughter, like the... The heart and soul that went into the, the writing process, it's just... Yeah, it, it's strange. Um, the first poem uh, was around my wife deceased in 2015. Um, that was a poem written to order. It wasn't one I sat down to write. Um, I've said, you know, write a poem to thank all of these people and make sure they're all mentioned. <laughs> this poem written to order. <laughs> and they were the brand that they, they um, decided the parameters of the, soul, mm. of the poem. And then uh, on uh, uh, was Trey's first daughter, um, uh, four other children, then Jonathan, Side me here, Emmett, and uh, Fiona, and um, and Marie. And on the day of Lucy's birthday, it was in the middle of January, waiting for news all day. And uh, it was killing the time, waiting for the news. And eventually it came quite late. Uh, and I've uh, been looking at TV, watching films, filling the time, and drinking a few glasses <laughs> to uh, um, ready the nerves. So I just took a long walk after that and uh, came back and sat down to a few things in the store fire, and the poem just came. So, that's, you know, so it is a nice way to end the day. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Born in the moment, the moment itself. Uh, yeah, and both for Josephine Hart then, of course, she's a tremendous writer. Um, and uh, the only personal connection I have is that I shared a desk with her brother in one year, in, in my, my first year, actually, in St. Mary's. Why did you know her? He was tragically killed that summer. Yeah. Uh, so very much invested in the sciences, and then there was an explosion uh, where he was experimenting, and the professor was killed here. So it's, uh, it's something that she lived with as well, but she yeah. took the life um, dimension of it, never to cave in, but to keep on going. She's a remarkable woman and that uh, because of the deaths in her family, there were three, uh, and all the expense and all the trauma, she had to forfeit third level education, university education, as we know it. So she was remarkably uh, self-educated. And uh, she read, uh, you know, four books every week. That was her way of educating herself. So extraordinary. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And um, then um, things just went right for her in London. And she had a remarkable life of success and particularly in promotion of poetry. 
uh, <clears throat> and um, happy marriage, and then her own kids, and eventually succumbing to cancer. But she didn't just bow under it, she never became resigned. I think is very important because that's the kind of uh, death wish on the way out. She fought till the very end and she kept going as far as she was doing. You know, and the way she reminds me of Edna O'Brien who in her 90s, um, you know, suffering from cancer, but every day she goes for chemo and then just continues on with her work. So it's that great and dominant spirit that I was celebrating in the poem, in that case, Josephine. Yeah. And she had an indomitable spirit and a pure heart of gold. She was a woman of great integrity. Um, and a, a huge inspiration for her story. I don't know if it, it would exist without her, to be honest. I think I told you before that we had um, we, we had a, a wonderful series of poetry therapy workshops as part of the Heart of Ireland Festival. Yes. And um, we invited Eleanor Carter, who was the director of the Josephine Hart Poetry Hour at the time. She came over to, to Mullingar and she gave the, the workshops. And we went actually to presentation senior school where Josephine went to school. And the children had never heard of her name, but they could tell me what Kim Kardashian had for breakfast that morning. So that was a big trigger for her story. And then a few months later, um, her holiday, her home, no, sorry, her, her home was bulldozed down, her family home, and it was turned into a car park. And there's been no efforts to commemorate her yet, as of yet, in, in Westmead County. Um, but at the same time, they were, there were very serious talks by the powers of be about building a museum to Niall Horan. He was 21 and thought it was quite a ludicrous idea. You don't build a museum to a 21 year old. So it was just, yeah, I suppose it was the, the paradox, the, the, you know, the, the polarizing treatment of a man, a local man and a woman, that was a big trigger for me. And I think the fact that she's such an amazing role model for young girls because she came, overcame so much tragedy and lived with extraordinary authenticity and talent. And her dynamic with Morris was one of the great love stories, really, of, of, the, of the, 20, the 21st century. Um, they really empowered and inspired each other. It was, it's so it's so wonderful to read, you know, when you when you get a great partnership, like a great match of equals like that. Um, so thank you so much for doing tribute to her. It's really powerful, John. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. Thanks, John. Um, so the next up we have Salome. And Salome is the founder of Akidwa. She's a researcher a gender equality activist and a human rights advocate with over 20 years experience of working with underrepresented groups, in particular with women, children, and young people in Europe, Africa, and all around the world. In 2018, Salome was appointed to the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission by the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. Salome has a master's degree in equality studies from UCD and she is currently on her final year of undertaking doctorate research on conflict, peace building and reconciliation at Trinity College Dublin. Hi, Salome. Hi, Melanie. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me uh, this evening. I was actually quite uh, moved by John, uh, John's poem. Um, they were all actually quite good and with a lot of meaning. So thank you. And it's a great pleasure to be part of this evening, you know, celebrating fathers and fathers who have contributed to our empowerment and to the way we have shaped in life. So I do really appreciate um, to be talking about my father and how he has shaped my life. Um, as you know, because I've spoken to you before, myself, I was born in Kenya and I grew up in Kenya, actually, in a family of nine. And my father has been, I think, a role model for all of us in the family because, uh, for example, he valued the education quite a lot. And, um, you know, when you were growing up, when I was born, actually, he was a teacher himself. He was a head teacher of one of the primary schools in Kenya. And he had educated himself because he had been uh, brought up in a very big family of where the father and the mother, they wouldn't be able to educate all of them. So as the firstborn of the family, he was asked to take care of himself. So he had to educate himself. And we saw him actually going to India, 
before I was born, he went to India. And after I was born, he came to UK to study. So education was so variable. Variable that, you know, he felt that even us, like we are five girls and four boys, that we should get it. Well, actually, in many African countries, and in particular in Kenya, because I did even take a research of um, girls out of school back in uh, when I was uh, in Kenya in, 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 in uh, late 1990s, was that, you know, boys were always prioritized when we come to education in Kenya. Many families didn't have uh, money to send both boys and girls to school. And girls were seen that uh, they were later get married and leave their families. So uh, education was always priori prioritized actually to, to, to boys. But in our case and in our situation, all nine of us are actually very highly educated. I would say that and um, uh, all of us actually, we are in good job. We've gone up to that level of education. But just to say that, you know, apart from that, I also saw him as a man who valued not only daughters, but gender equalities in general. And he motivated me quite a lot from that. Uh, again, when you're growing up, you know, in, in the custom, in, in Kenyan custom and tradition, it's very unlikely that uh, a woman uh, become, um, you know, or inherit or get uh, the, um, you know, the, the property of the man when the man is alive. And my ma my father actually gave a whole estate, a coffee estate to my mother to manage, but not only to manage, she, she had to open a bank account and control the money and use that money. And that was actually amazing and shocking. And just actually before he died, because he died there in 2011, uh, I was actually one of the people in, in the whole family of the nine that uh, he gave me a property. Uh, I'm a sixth born in the family, but in property as well, uh, which meant you know, for him, he valued all of us equally, but uh, he always actually praised the girls and said that the girls are his girls, you know, and girls are capable of doing anything that uh, boys can do. Uh, his, his passion for, for, for education was that, you know, people would become better if they're educated. And he used to say that, you know, education has no limit. You can get educated at any time of your life. And we saw this with him. He set a good example. Even coming he was late 40s, you know, when he came to study uh, in UK itself. But I also remembered actually a few weeks before he died, because he died on the 19th of February. And two weeks before he died, I had called him and we were talking and we were talking about my eldest daughter. And he kept on insisting that I, I should make all effort and make sure that uh, my, get a, my daughter get good education and that she has an education to back herself, especially what he called in a foreign land, that maybe if you don't have education, it would be very difficult uh, to excel or to do better in life. And so uh, I'm very actually happy. And I say he's in heaven. He's watching all this. My daughter just finished uh, her four-year bachelor's of art in performing art in Sraigo, and she will be graduating, uh, God willing, now next month. So I am very happy that I've been able to fulfill one of the things that he wanted uh, me to, to do. Uh, he wanted us to, to be able able to do that. He wanted me to be to be able to do that before uh, anything else. But I was also much uh, inspired by the, his courage and faith. You know, we were brought up in the Catholic Church, and uh, you know, for him, um, the ethos of the church and and being being humble was so much um, something that he he always told us that you know we have to live in a way that we 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 appreciate people you know we he encouraged us actually to be uh, to be courageous and especially think that you know if there's any injustice that people are experiencing you do not keep quiet courage to talk about it and i could see it actually because uh, one time our school was uh, almost grabbed you know by by people who wanted to use the land and to have the land and he challenged that uh, in quite a big uh, form he also brought lawyers to be able to challenge the, that injustice standing up at um, and actually bringing us to places of where we could run any time uh, that he was very steep I also liked uh, the way he used his influence, you know, to move things and to, to be able to convince people to do better. We didn't have, for example, a place for worship in my place. And we used to do the mass in my house because we didn't have anywhere. And he actually convinced uh, people in my village where I come from uh, to be able to construct the church. And then later on, he asked me, because I was here, can I help to buy the seats for the church? Um, so he was a very influential person and he would always want the best uh, for everybody. He was actually a humble man himself. And I remember him saying that, you know, even whatever you do, you don't bring yourself on the front. And I saw him like when he came even to visit me here. 
and we went to the church here. He said he cannot sit on the front because you don't sit on the front because you can always be asked to go back or at the behind. And he said, but when you sit at the behind, you can be asked to come on the front and, and that shows you are important. So you do not actually go throwing yourself and telling people to see how big you are or how good you are. You let people see it yourself and they can... Um, praise you if they want but do not go placing yourself or putting yourself into positions uh, that that actually may um take the meaning of, of 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 your humbleness or who you are at the end of the day he was a very respecting man and i learned from him and he contributed quite a lot to how i respect people and how i see people uh, based on the fact that you know he was not the type that goes fighting people and he respected people's privacy but also people's um uh, ways of doing things so he wouldn't actually force himself to to doing things that are not um you know they are, they are not they are good for others or they, they are not respectful so there's quite a lot you know that i could talk uh, about him even his kindness and his giving even reaching out and actually i've learned a lot from him of reaching out and even here i find myself every time trying to reach out to people to see well, how they are doing how i can help and all that and even the finding founding of akidoa because it was actually as a result of listening to people talking to people and actually using the influence of um, looking into how we can we can contribute to doing good and and challenging the inequality that uh, we were experiencing at the time. Um, it was actually through the courage that I had seen from him and and through that kindness of of, of reaching out and doing all all these things. So he 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 has actually influenced me quite a lot in that way and also the, the empathy that 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 i have the empathy of empathizing with the situation in my fight for equality and justice it doesn't have to be an issue that is affecting me um it could be actually an issue that is affecting other people it doesn't have to be and that's what he kept on saying you do not have to fight for justice for the issues that is affecting you you actually have to fight for other people as well because if you're comfortable but when other people are uncomfortable, then it's not right. And I remember actually, for example, um, when I was organizing in the early days of Akido in 2004, and we had um, many migrant women, in particular African women, that had uh, trained in Akido on um, capacity building training. And these women had let us. I used the courage that I had gained from him uh, and also... Um, empathy that I had actually also seen that, you know, myself, I wasn't facing deportation. There were almost 17,000 were deported. And, uh, you know, I, I, I came up with um, a statement which I presented in the Doyle. I initiated a campaign, the Coalition Against Deportation of ID Citizen, and I gathered people of whom actually people came to actually support, you know, through the influence of, uh, like, you know, explaining to them of, of what is happening, but also strategizing on what we should do and then getting that support from people itself. So it was... Um, quite quite good that I learned from him a lot of things you know um, and those values I take uh, I take them with me actually uh, to be able to reach out and to be able to help um, it's it's quite unfortunate that he had to pass pass on and uh, th that uh, what I actually hear from him is the echoes of everything that he was saying and everything oh. he used to to do. Actually, my picture with my picture with him that I've given to you was at the airport because he used to come to the airport to drop me and pick me. And I remember even 2007 there were conflict in Kenya and um, I I had to go home because I had already cut a ticket to go home um, mm -hmm. that December and he actually came quickly to pick me at the airport that was his college um and he said that i'll be there even if we die we'll die all of us so he was such a man that you would want to have and to continue having because he was not selfish he was selfish as himself and we could learn quite a lot a lot from him so every time i hear the echoes of his words you know the kind words that you do but also his humbleness of not um putting himself into fight or undermining people or trying to pull other people down. That was the kind of a person he was. And uh, for me to believe that, you know, we are all born equal, whether we are men or women, and actually for him, he valued, I would say, and my mother always says even up to now, that my father valued his daughter more than uh, his sons. And in my culture, again, when you die, it's the sons that hold your, your casket, you know, and, and take you to the, to, the, to the grave. But for him, he said, even my daughters can do 
do that there, equally able to do that. So he was a very positive man. And um, I, I think even well, sometimes when people are talking and they're talking about, about somebody, I, my father, will, will, you will never hear him talking bad about somebody. And even for me here, I find myself saying, even if there's somebody, we are saying there's something wrong with that person, there must be something good about that person too. And so it's about being uh, positive, it's about being supportive and not uh, undermining others and pulling others down. And so to say that, you know, the courage, the confidence, um, the influence that I have and everything that I have, it's him because um, I went to a boarding school as well. So he used to come and visit me. He buys food and he does everything for me. So it's it's mm -hmm. really like a, a man who was a feminist himself and mm -hmm. wanted the best for not only for women, but for the world. Um, so that that's him in a nutshell. In a nutshell, my, what a man, what a great man, and what an incredible influence, because you're an extraordinary daughter, Salome, like really what you've achieved. I mean, a kid was going to be 20 years old next year, big anniversary. Absolutely. Year. Yeah, and we are going to talk so that we can work together, you know, to sure. talk about all these issues. There's quite a lot of her story which is not written on these migration stories of women, and actually linking to them what is happening now on the issues of racism, because... Akido was founded on those grounds and I couldn't keep quiet, you know, and I was actually going to uh, to, to talk about, like, you know, you had asked, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the healing from the trauma of patriarchy because, uh, you know, when, when I came to Ireland and I, I was, it was actually early years in 1994, um, I was a nov novelty, novelty people, you know, had not seen, there were no many people of, my, you know, right. Africans, you know, I call them beautiful people. And so you, you wouldn't see so many people. And then coming to 1998, when we had a lot of big numbers of people coming in at the time. Um, so we, I started experiencing that in depth um, experience of both uh, physical and um, verbal racism. And actually even forming a kiddo and putting a kiddo up, it was actually as a result of my own experience of uh, racial discrimination. If you look at our website, you will see because that's how we started it. You know, I met women. I used to actually stop every woman, African woman in the street, and I asked them, how are they getting on in Ireland? So my mobilization skills are also very good. I could talk to people, get their address number. We didn't have mobile phones that time. And then we could talk about our experiences. And the experiences of women were really, really bad, you know. So uh, with this college, and uh, what I had learned from my father that you cannot um, shy from injustice if it's happening you have to talk about it you know I just felt that you know we needed to talk about it and I gave the, those women courage even up to now when some of the women mm, talk and, and call in the office they say how I give them courage to be able to stand up and talk because I speak about my own experience and that's why I wanted to say that it's it's very important that when we are challenging this um, we are hearing from the trauma of patriarchy to be brave and to step out of out of our comfort zone and to be able actually to share about our experiences um, and being yeah. having that personal awareness of, of where we are coming from uh, and the willingness of looking into where we are going. So uh, it, it all links up um, into what we grow from uh, to where we end up leading. Exactly. And like the power of storytelling, I mean, is there another more, more power, powerful force? We saw that with the repeal the AIDS referendum. It was the stories of, of everyday women, the silent voices that won the referendum. And we're seeing that, I think, with the, the Black Lives Matter campaign, which I was, I've was i been following intently for the last few weeks. Somebody said to me, you know, the campaign doesn't have a leader like Dr. Martin Luther King in this lifetime. But I said, you watch it on Twitter, though, there are so many everyday heroes and heroines of the campaign and voices that yeah. normally wouldn't be heard. And I, I, I was so moved. I mean, gosh in floods of tears watching some of the stories and the, the, the importance yeah. of being witnessed, being heard and to be really mm. listened to. And, and um, I, I think I told you, Salome, I did my degree thesis on deconstructing colonial ideologies and racial stereotyping. Mm -hmm. I can honestly yeah. say it was one of the darkest three months of my life studying racism and how those ideologies were constructed, the psychological processes Mm -hmm. Um, I had a saw me from writing it. It was just like it is. If people even knew a fraction of the truth behind racism, oh, it's just yeah. it's chilling. 
So this is very, very close to my heart. For me, racism mm -hmm. is a bigger truth gender. It always has been. Um, so yeah. I know we're working. We, and we already decided that we're going to collaborate together on, on a huge project for the next three years before the riots started in the US. So hopefully we'll get the funding. It should be announced at the end of the month. But we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen no matter what. Um, yeah, it's very that, 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 a huge respect for what you're doing. Like it's just, you know, for the last 20 years to be a trailblazer in that field, you know, it's not easy. It is yeah. actually, it's not easy, but the most, cha the, the biggest challenge is that, you know, there's the still deep, very deep inequalities uh, that I've been trying to fight uh, for mm -hmm. the last 20 years. And sometimes you mm -hmm. feel like, you know, even when people talk about George Floyd, his killing and the way it happened, you know, it's not that these issues have not been talking about them. In fact, uh, I've been fighting like from the beginning and the founding time of Akido uh, work in 1999, 2000, you know, it was about racism. It was about an equal distribution of power in the way people are treated, in particular yeah. African women. We did our first research there back in 2007 on black African women in the Irish labor market, which it, that time was the same with this time now. It, nothing that has changed. And it's because actually there's no political will and commitment or even leadership to be able to help. That myself, I can do too much. I can actually take from what my father has given me and what the world have given me because I've also been supported by so many other men and women out there to be able to reach where I am in terms of the organization and in terms of my own mm -hmm. development. But um, not unless we have these uh, structures changing, you know, uh, which is patriarchy because we also have women's problem, but the issues of racism in this country is a huge is, problem and yeah. so many people don't see it as a problem and they don't yeah. think it exists, but it's so much there well, in is. so many forms. There, and, it, yes. and that's good to for as well as it can be very subtle. But I tell you, I. I had a really profound experience. I went to a school called Wilson's Hospital School and in the middle of nowhere in rural Ireland, like multi farnham if you ever heard of the visit, village, it's like 20 minutes outside Mullingar. And I experienced how wonderful multiculturalism and inclusion can be. And I was only 15 years old at the time. There were students there from 24 countries. Every skin color, every religion, every, like it was just, fabulous experience and we all thrived there was a richness yeah. in the diversity you just don't get it in monoculture monoculture is boring i try i thrive i've always looked for those opportunities but it's it's about integration and inclusion and we are we have a lot to learn in ireland because we are the rest of ireland is, is newly multicultural and we i think we do want to really learn i think you saw that with the, the last election we effectively silenced the far right um politicians yeah. when they were starting the election we just said not interested we're not going far right so that's a really positive step. But in terms of inclusion and diversity, like I mean, I've hosted events and the friends have come to me and said, oh, God, it's so great to hear, you know, a voice of a woman from Kenya or Palestine. I'm like, what do you mean it's so great? Of course you should be hearing their voices. Why are you not hearing these voices? Yeah. And they're not seeing them. They're not hearing these voices, mm. you know, in, um, in the Dublin cultural sphere, which is, I just find shocking, you know? Because I mean, yeah, I, because I live people in excluded. Paris, so you live in London and Paris, like it's, especially London, it's very integrated. And it's just, you just thrive. It's so normal. It's so natural to be multicultural. Like we are, we're a migratory species. You know, it's 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 um, it's like you know they say the word diversity is like a modern buzzword. It's not. It's always been. Yeah, but the island has to open itself. Uh, the people, yeah. I don't say, because when you say island, it's people. We are the people. I'm talking about everybody. You, you're yes. opening yourself by bringing us along to be able to be part of this program and project. There are so many things that are happening in Ireland every day, but people are not open yeah. to welcome other people, especially people from other diversities. You know, people have to exclude others to be able to understand where they're coming from. You know, people in mm. Ireland used to see the black babies boxes. You know, they used to hear of fairly very far away in Democratic Republic of Congo or Kenya. Now we are here. We can actually engage and interact. But are people open to those dialogues and those engagements? Because that's how you can only challenge prejudice and stereotype. And it's the only way that you can actually educate people on where you are coming from rather than what they have seen on the TV or read from yeah. books that they read from you as the human book yourself. Uh, but people have to be open to be able to do that. But you also have to challenge the institutional, you know, racism and the, the, the structures, the, system, so the systematic, systemic, uh, systemic actually structures uh, that are racist and uh, discriminative, we have to be able to work on all levels, you know, to be able to combat racism.
I hear you. And I'm really looking forward to working with you going forward in the future because we've got two big themes actually for Hearthstone for the next three years. And one of them is inclusion diversity. Mm -hmm. um, That's brilliant. Yeah. So we're going to meet up and we're going to, once the lockdown list, I think we should sit down together and really, I'll share my plans and, yeah. we'll, and we'll co create together. We'll collaborate on it. So that'd be really, I'd love to see you again. It'd be fantastic. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, we should do that. Looking forward. Thank to you. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. You're amazing. What a trailblazer. Thank Your dad you. is so proud of you. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks so much. Okay, on to yes. our next speaker. So we have Jim Fitzpatrick, who does he need an introduction? He's the legendary um, Celtic artist. He's also very well known for his Tin Lizzy artwork and his iconic portrait of Che Guevara. Um, Jim has been a Her Story Godfather since 2017, and he's a trustee on the Her Story board as well. So happy Father Day, Jim. Thank you. Are you there? You. How are you? I have company here. I can't get rid of him. Oh, yeah. well, it is Father's Day. He's like one of my and children. Many, many kittens as well. I know it's a boy, isn't it? It is a boy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I'm talking to my daughter, he has to be in the picture. Yeah. That's why he's here. Anyway, we try and ignore him. If not, I'll put him out. But he's usually good. I'm good. I'm absolutely good. Uh, I woke up to a beautiful message from my daughter this morning, wishing me a happy Father's oh, Day. And she's watching this, so I have to be careful. Between your best behavior. so Because you've got a really special relationship, don't you? Oh, we have an amazing bond from the day she was born. She was always my little girl. And she's still my little girl because, you know, we're all a bit grown up now, including her. <clears throat> but... Uh, it's very difficult for me to describe how you feel about your own daughter because I grew up in a very strange household reared by women. My mother, my mother's mother's sister, who I called my grandmother, my two aunts. Wow. And they were fantastic people, don't get me wrong, but they never expressed emotion. My mom could never have told me really? that she loved me. She adored me. I'm not stupid. But she could never express right. it. And that's the way a lot of people were, especially women back then. And the first thing I did when I was young, I was just normally affectionate. So I could tell my daughter I loved her. I could tell my kids, my sons, I loved them. I can even tell my cat I love her. But that wasn't something that was done back then. It's really hard to explain to younger people. I'm talking about two, three generations ago. I'm getting on a bit now. They were hard to yeah. Where she was abandoned by her husband, my father, uh, who was a bit of a gambler and a playboy and a photographer. Well, he was a professional photographer for the Irish Times and uh, the Irish Press. Okay. He had a lot of scoops that, uh, you know, made his name. When I say scoops, I don't mean drinks. I mean press scoops. <laughs> he had too many scoops as well. <laughs> That's where most of the money went. Yeah. And he gambled wow. and he binge drinker, you name it. But he left when I was five. And I have to say, one of the great joys of my life and the great moments of my life have been when I was aware that I, obviously I'm a boy, I was a man, sorry, I was a boy, I'm a man. But when those moments, when you needed support, right? Mm. And you had these powerful women backing you up, there was no, I mean, I don't want to rant about the past, but I remember the thing, the man called the cruelty man who came around and he was the one who was watching kids and they used to steal them, put them before the courts and off the dang and you went, you know, they used to, I mean, we, when I was young, you got threatened with dangan. Like if you don't behave yourself, you're going to dangan. I didn't know what dangan was. Now I know it was a center for the most brutal abuse of children, I think in the entire country. So oh, let her nice. back as well. But anyway, I always remember the cruelty man called to our door and he got a whack from my mother. My mother was very posh, very upright. Now, I'll have to give the context. We were living in a, then a tough area that's now gentrified, St. Michael's Road, Drumcondra. Fabulous area. Up the road is the Botanic Gardens. Across the road was the park, Griffith yeah. Park, where I played football. Beautiful area. And, and it's still beautiful. The Talca beside us, which flooded and put me in hospital with TB, but otherwise was absolute magnificent place to live. But when the cruelty man came to my mother's door, he didn't come back. There was always this threat that I could be kidnapped by my own father, right? 
So I learned martial arts, everything like that, in the Dominic Savio Boys Club in Glasnevin, the old wooden church beside it. And we had this constant thing of my mother telling me to be careful, to watch out, as you would most people. But in my case, it was kind of extreme. Like, And I had all these little plans for what would happen if my father kidnapped me, which legally he could without this problem with the law. He could come over or send someone over to take me to London where he worked and lived for the BBC. So these threats govern my upbringing, right? It's a wonder I'm not paranoid schizophrenic, but there you go. And I always felt that I was blessed to be raised in a house full of strong women. My Aunt Claire was a genius who taught me everything about what I call educational matters. She even taught me to read. Now that took patience. I was slow, you know. Now, the other aunt was a palliative nurse, a caring nurse in uh, St. Luke's looking for sick and dying people. So I'd listen to her tell me about some blue, beautiful woman she'd been looking after. And the pain and sorrow that she had in her voice when she talked about the end of this particular person. You realized there's a depth of care in women that I don't think men can quite get to. I'm not denigrating men's feelings, but there's a depth there that even now I find it hard to conceive of, which brings me to my own daughter. Five years ago, I had cancer. Now I have great kids, right? But you suddenly realize you have a daughter when something happens like that, oh, yeah. right? My son wanted to come over from LA. <clears throat> no, my other son up north wanted to drive me to Kim on radio all the time. No, but my daughter came over, especially after each operation, I had two of them, and I'm now put back to shape. And it was like having a guardian angel. My mother was very much my guardian angel and my aunts, but this was a real guardian angel. And I used to sit in that hospital bed up in Beaumont and then Bon Secours. And all I could think of was, what time? It's coming to two o'clock. My daughter's coming. And she would always be, she has a wonderful sense of humor. She takes the piss out of me if she's watching this now. You should be talking to her, not me. <laughs> because- oh, yeah, we should have done that. Both of you, actually. Uh, she Whenever. worked yeah. every morning after I have my cup of coffee. We talk for half an hour. And it's usually politics. It's not about feelings. We, she rants about Trump, rant about Trump, about Trump. And then we're talking about Black Lives Matter. She's very passionate about anything like that. Oh, yeah. The stuff you see behind me, by the way, I just took up there especially. They are oh, drawing my 1968 and 69. Martin Luther King, Angela Davis, there's one here of, one of my heroes, Malcolm X. These were all done in the 60s. She has colorized them. She's a, you work in advertising, actually. We talk about that in a sec. She has colorized them, and they're beautiful. And now we're in business together, would you believe? She has launched (laughs) a range of my work in silk scarves, and by sheer coincidence, I'm not, there's no link to that, this is not promo. This is to show my daughter at work. We had, we had these made in Oma, right? Can we get one? And this one is the Black Rose one, which we oh, launched, Rose? she launched with my son, who runs my website, only a while ago. And the bloody ah, thing sold out. Right? So this is my daughter wow. here, using my art. And getting back to uh, advertising, you mentioned Bill Felton. Yes, Bill. Bill. With all the other drawings of the different women, Bill is a good mate of mine from way back. But Bill gave Suzanne, my daughter, her first break. I didn't know that. That's good. Nice. Worked in the uh, Irish International, uh, Wilson Hartnell. She worked all over the place till the recession came and she moved to Italy. That's why she's not here with me. She's in Italy. And I haven't seen oh, her since Christmas. And that's the longest we've ever been apart. So really we're, making, well. we're making plans. She's coming over here on the 14th of July. Yeah. The reunion will be all the sweeter for it, I tell you. Oh, I can't wait. But anyway, uh, getting back to empowering daughters, I said to my daughter, can I empower you? (laughs) Because I don't remember empowering her. And yet she's a totally empowered feminist, right? Hmm, Where did that come from? And (laughs) she said she wasn't aware of any impediments in front of her as a woman, as a girl growing up because Um, that was the way she grew up with me and her mom and her brothers and her neighbors. 
she could see with some of her friends it wasn't quite like that. But she took it for granted that she was an equal. I mean, 100% equal, not a part equal, not a feminine version of equality, a full version of equality from day one. And the great thing about advertising, when she went into it, and one of the reasons I wanted her to go into advertising was even in the 60s when I worked in advertising, there were no impediments to women. I was, a group, I was a group head. Well, you work so you'd know. I was a group yeah. head in Wilson Hartnell. And by the yeah. time I was leaving, I had a group that was entirely composed of women, right? And I'll tell you why. Okay. We used to beat all the other groups two to one, three to one, getting new accounts in. You know the whole thing, madman yeah. stuff, you know? Oh, yeah. Okay. The glory of the cold hamburger at midnight and all this crap, you know? But these women, like, oh, yeah, yeah. like the back powers. Yeah, in the middle but of the women, once you treated them properly, by Christ, they'd kill for you. Do you know what I mean? Oh. They worked harder than any men I knew. And mm. they had my back and I had theirs. And that's yeah. what I wanted my daughter to experience. And sure enough, I asked her today about it. She said that was exactly like that. There were no impediments to her in advertising. You know what I mean? None at yeah. all. Luckily. And you're actually in a great department. It was an advantage because I was in... Um... A copywriter did art direction as well, but so there was in the creative department at my time. My, I was there, God, back in 2009, I graduated, and 10% of the creative department were women. Yeah, so you knew the guy didn't have. Um, and I remember actually they'd often put me on, they try and put me on some of the women's brands, and then I'd get the the, the brief for the World Rugby Cup, and I'd outright the guys and like really gritty, yeah. you know. Just to prove yeah. the point yeah, that I'm. Like, a well, woman could walk into a male environment right. like working for the IRFU and her council. Yeah. And if she had better ideas, out the door with everybody else, lads. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's fair. Oh, absolutely. And that's the way it should be. But anyway, I think, you know, when I talk about my daughter, all I can think of is just the intense love you feel for your own daughter and the intense love that she reflects back. It's quite extraordinary. We don't talk about this, so she's probably cringing. No. <laughs> but she knows I love her. I absolutely adore the ground she walked on. But I, I tell you what, she once said to me, because we were talking about, have we ever fallen out over that? And I'm sure we have, but it doesn't, I can't even remember. She couldn't either. But she said, uh, the only time we came close was when Roy Keane walked out of the Irish team in Saipan. <clears throat> and luckily we're on the same page because she said to me it's just as well that we're agreeing on this dad because Roy Keane is our hero like for my birthday I get Keno's biography for fucking Christmas excuse my language I got Alex Ferguson's deal for me <laughs> and I played football until I was bloody 68 anyway so I deserved them but long story quite short she said to me if you'd have been on the other side in this argument, Dad, we would never have got on again, right? And that's the only time we ever could have fallen out because we're both so passionate about something. Now, I'd say the same thing applies today to Mr. Trump, but we won't go into that. No, no. Not today. Yeah. Not today. Yeah. 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 If I was to turn and say anything nice about Donald, she would go nuts. And now and then I do just to annoy her, just to wind her up. But she knows me too well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it. Aww. But anyway, she's I, a wonderful rebellious fun. streak in her that I love. She doesn't take crap even from me. Well, I know where she gets that from. I know. You're quite know. Right yourself, like. Do you know what? I'm a tame feminist in comparison to yourself and John Ennis. Like, my sorry her story, and I had my I call it my feminist awakening. I would sit down and spend hours talking to the two of you. And Jesus, I tell you, you put the fire in me so you would, you know? And uh, well, I it's amazing. I, you. I was quite amazed. I was quite amazed when I met you, how strong you were. Not in a, what's the word, in an aggressive way. No. You're very persuasive. Am I? Oh, yeah. And I walked into it because... It was kind of subtle. You came out, we were walking the mountain uh, up the summit yeah. and all the rest of it in the woods. And you were telling me all about these ideas you had. And I was going, holy Christ, these are brilliant. You know what I mean? I love the whole idea of her story, you know? Mm -hmm. And you asked me to get involved. I think you wanted to use one of my works or something to project. And I thought, deadly, you know? So that's how I got involved, almost accidentally. Well, I thought it was accidentally. <laughs> you probably didn't. 
I always admire your art because I remember like it was a formative influence on me. I remember seeing these empowered women, like very rooted in their sexuality. That's why I always love them. They really owned their sexuality. Bro. Really wrong. The, God, the Asian goddess culture, that authentic feminine power that you just, you don't really see it like, like portrayed like that in popular culture these days. Well, the best kind of compliment I ever got. Huh? The best compliment I ever got about my work was from Sinead O'Connor, actually. I worked for Sinead, did quite a few album covers for her, Faith and Courage. Beautiful person to work with, wonderful woman. <clears throat> Someone I admired hugely. And I met her in a nightclub. I was introduced to her by another girl singer I was hanging out with called Isha, who was superb. Okay. And Sinead said something, I can't go into the details because it's personal to her. But she said there was a point in her life, and she told me about it at the time, that was quite brutal and awful. And on her wall was a poster of one of my goddesses. I think it was the goddess Palu, the cat goddess. And she said, while this was going on, she'd lie there and look at that poster. And that she felt it gave yeah. her power. And I remember thinking, God, in all my efforts to create something amazing or create something yeah. unique or to celebrate women, I never thought of anything like that. I never thought it would influence someone like that, especially someone like her, an amazingly interesting woman, but a very powerful woman. And to be honest with you, Jimmy, you had a similar you had a similar effect of me. You gave me a print of Tal shoot when I was going through quite a challenging time with the project. It was very early days, and I mean Tal shoot, she's just pure fire. Like, this, she's this is stopping her. From her here. And, I didn't know you were going to you. Hold on. I have a, there she is. I mean, look at her. Would you mess sure. with her? Yeah. You don't mess with that one. You gave me the fire and the strength that I really needed. Like you were it was you, just hit the nail on the head, so thank you so much. And we could talk all evening, and I'm afraid we're already running behind schedule. No, but I'm going to pop out to you. I want to thank you all. Yeah. Thank you all the other speakers. John Ennis' poems are brilliant. I'll have to get his They're book. gorgeous, aren't they? Yeah, you've got to meet John these days. Salome as well, out in the south side. We're talking, I, I made a joke with her the other day that she probably doesn't remember, just on Twitter, I think, that maybe Storms oh, yeah. would give her a million to open one out here. You know what I mean? Wouldn't be brilliant. But anyway. These are interesting times. Well, we'll chat soon. Yeah. The same organization in Britain. So maybe if he knew it was an Irish version of it for immigrant women. Brilliant. Not shot, but you never mm. know. I mean, you get nowhere unless you ask. Yeah. I'll ask. Anyway, it's great to talk to you all. You too, Jim. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good evening. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, we're good. Is Ellie there? Hope we don't have too many technical problems because it's been a bit temperamental. There she is. <laughs> is here yet, Turn on your camera if you can. I didn't hear. I didn't hear any word of you. Oh, I okay. I didn't I'll hear. I didn't hear any word of you. Did you not? <laughs> Oh dear, how are you? I'm so tired. You're Should tired. I like? Yeah, I've been. I'm I've not been supposed to be. Yeah, I've been like in bed all day. And good, good. I don't know what really happened to me today. Like, I was just, anyway, days like this just kind of sometimes overwhelm me. So I, I was just like overwhelmed with grief for, by. You know, for some reason, but I but I know why. Anyway, I didn't know why. So, yeah. So I just lied down the whole day, and you know, like then I just like let me just go quickly have a shower and and show up. 
<laughs> don't you do it. Yeah, we'll go gently with you. Yeah, because you've had a very busy few weeks. I know you were heavily involved in the Black Lives Matter campaign in Ireland, and it was Refugee Week this week as well. Yeah, it was Refugee Week. I think kind of like that's what took me on. Like it's the yeah. refugee, like just the apps of like the the rush of the Black Lives Matter, and then yeah. it comes to like it was just like a combination of two nonstop. So mm -hmm. yeah, but anyway, I'm okay. I'm fine. I can't complain much because that's what makes you. You know, like a uh, uh, a more like superhuman, yeah. <laughs> I can see the sparkle in your eyes. Yeah, I tell. Yeah, yeah. I remember, like flashbacks to last summer when we, myself and Caitlin, sat down with you in our <laughs> table HQ in the Irish Refugee Council um, yeah. in Dublin, and you like, nearly had us in tears talking about your dad and how much he inspired you and empowered you and how you wouldn't be doing what you're doing today without his support. Like, uh, I don't like to keep my dad in the past. Like, uh, like every day it's like mm. the present for me because I always feel like he's just right be like right beside me and Aww. my sim I love my dad. Like I really loved my dad and loved him and still love him too now. And I always feel like, uh, my dad is still around us. Like every time my dad's still around us. And let me tell you something that happened last week, right? When I when I kind of like get a dream of my dad, that means there is something that really, really is happening, right? So I had a dream of my dad. Like I'll just cut it short because eventually it really happened, right? So I kind of like dream about my dad brought me a present, right? But it was something that I am like I've been working for, right? In, but in the in the dream, it was like a present. So my dad said, he just said, like, just remember to give five percent to your sister, right? Oh. <laughs> I wake up in the morning, like I wake yeah. up in the morning, and I said to my sisters, like, did you know your father was here? And I just have to tell you because uh, because he said me to do something for you, and we just kind of laughed, mm -hmm. Melanie just exactly 12 o'clock 12 midnight midday of that day i just got a call just exactly in my father's dream <laughs> oh my god yeah. i just said wow and it would have looked a little bit corny if maybe i didn't mention this to anybody right <laughs> yeah, yeah but but because i just wake up that morning and i don't know what really made me and uh, i woke up my son and I was like, you know, your granddad was here. You know, he's kind of funny. <laughs> like, he was here. And this is what he said. And I called my sister and I said, like, uh, um, your father was here. And this is what he said to me. And then, like, after that, around 12 o'clock is when I got that call. And I just called my sister. I said, you remember I told you your dad was here? Yeah. So <laughs> he just made everything happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like, uh, I always feel like so let me just speak about my dad. Like I would speak about my dad and my uncle today. Like these are like super, like super, super heroes, like men of all times in my life. Mm. So my father was a such like a bubbly, nice, like my father was very pompous. And I just, I, and I don't even like shy to speak about him that way because that's who he is. And he felt like he's super good in what he does, which he was super good in what he does. He was a feminist himself. Like I'm coming from Africa and Africa culture is, you know, like it's men control and the women and all of that. He married mm -hmm. like multiple wives, like uh, he married like multiple, not but uh, at one time, but he married my first, first uh, mother who we have had a very great relationship. And then he married my mom, you know, so I've got my half sisters too. I had my half sisters too, but we, we like for somebody to know that somebody is really great is to be somebody that can actually have this branded, you know, like her uh, family, yeah. you know, and make sure that you are all uh, important and you are all equal, right? But wow. I was, I was like one of my, um, one of my many, like one of the very loved daughter of my dad. And that's how funny yeah. it was. 
yeah both my parents they were academics like my father uh my father he did well he was a very uh he was a ceo of agriculture development company which it covers like osalic country it's an agricultural company he studied in uh, kansas university he studied in a uh, uh he studied in oxford so my father was well read and my mother mm -hmm. too because my mother she was a very like one of the very first financial state uh um accountants so uh, you know, they were pretty good and, you know, like they were young, they met while they were young, although my father like had a, um, a first wife, but I know why he had to do that because like in my father's culture, they kind of like do these arranged marriages. So okay. the first wife, yeah, so the first wife was really arranged by, you know, his family. So he couldn't yeah. take a control of that, you know what I mean? And uh, mm -hmm. he was like one of the first uh, generation to do well, uh, very much educated. And not only educated, but be successful because my father was very successful. And uh, and uh, and I, I am proud that, you know, it's just unfortunate that we ended up in the tragedy that we were to lose all of them and you know, like become parentless and be where we are at the moment. But uh, you know, that's why I was that's why I say like it kind of like it 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 brings me more emotions because like when I go back and you know, like when I look life and from where I am, and sometimes it always like I always ask God like why? But anyway, I, I know like God has always has his own plans, so we can't actually uh control what he wants for people so and not even being like that i also like i was born into both of my families because they are politically involved so my father's side they were political strong politically involved and my mother's side they were both politically involved so my father wow. and my mom they will be coming both from the my father will be coming like from the opposition and my my mother will be coming from the then ruling party like that's where her brothers and all of that they were because my uncle was a second vice president of the malawi congress party so like uh they'll be yeah so there'll be like a crash of their like political uh aspirations and all of that but they branded really well because my mother was a very very quiet person like my mom she 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 wasn't like me my sister she's like my mom right but i'm my daddy's version right <laughs> mm -hmm. so if i was like mm -hmm. a, if i was if i was a boy i'll be like the dad like like my son my, my, my the, the son of my dad right but i'm a daughter of my my dad because like the people that knew me they always like tell like this is really a version of crement because my father was crement this is really a version of crement in his in in her own rights of his dad you know like people always go cause me like that which actually makes me uh uh more happy he raised me as as like he when i'm saying like he raised me like a man because like uh, you know yourself like uh, irish people they are also like that so like in in african culture we have the trail whereby you know like men child are more important than girl girl child but my father never differentiate of like uh, oh she's a girl or she he's a man right and he even mm -hmm. trusted me more than even my brothers i've got a cousin of mine i've got a cousin of mine now who he's very very much political political act, uh, political active right and he grew up in our house partly of his life right so when he was actually growing up like he always reminds me like when he sees my life and he always tells me like, you know, when I look at you like now, I always see your father's father's vision. Cause like, I think that's exactly how your father wanted to be. My father at a young age, we were really lucky that, you know, like we were sent away for schools. We went to the private schools, you know, which and is very, very unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, which is very, very fortunate. We went to private schools. I traveled to go and study and all of that. I had so much opportunities to actually access not like the way i see people thrive to get those opportunities but my father opened up for us like okay. him coming from a background whereby he actually they were his parent wasn't like very very rich but they are coming from the culture whereby they are these people that they their their richness of his father were coming from owning a lot of kettles right like mm -hmm. if you've heard about the maasai people of kenya so so my yeah. father, yeah, so my father, his father, his ancestors, they'll be coming from Tanzania, 
they are coming from Mologolo, Tanzania. So there were these people that they used to have a lot of head of cows and they'll be like moving in searching of the green pasture to feed their 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 thing. So they weren't they weren't like really really that poor, right? Because they were able to have these um these uh animals. And then my father growing up in that structure and being able to also have a very good education and also mm -hmm. being able to see the success between the education and the hard working. My father was both, right? My father wow. was both, right? He was really, really both. And he believed in investment and he believed in establishing himself. And he also believed in self-made and he even do that to other people, right? And that's yes. why... Most of the generation, like what I'm telling you about, like my cousin that now he's very, very active, a political, um, uh, a political candidate. He made mm -hmm. sure that every child that came through our house, who he mm -hmm. raised, whether it's from his sister's son or his sister, his brother's son or his brother's daughter, he made sure that he made them like who they mm -hmm. are today. And I can tell right. you, like every one of them. They're very, 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 when I mean very successful, very successful people, mm. right? So like wow. uh, to see, really to cool. see the money that he was, to me, I, I always mm. say like my father is a hero, not only to me, myself, oh. my siblings, but to many, mm. because when my father died, unfortunately, my father died young, right? So when my father died, people were coming to mourn him, right? Mm that we didn't actually know who were coming to mourn him, right? Mm -hmm. And people were like, who's going to pay my child's school fees? Who's going to pay my, uh, my, 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 my house? Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay my mortgage, you know? And mm -hmm. the company that he had, it's the agriculture development, uh, development company, it's a very huge company in Salic region. So it covers Malawi, Tanzania, South mm -hmm. Africa, Zimbabwe, so this company, it's up to now, like really existing, but they just changed it into something else. So this company built, I don't know if you've heard about silos, silos, you have them even in silos, I right? Know. Yeah. Yeah. So you preserve food. So, you know, mm -hmm. like, and you know yourself that Malawi was one of the food, the country that, although it was poor, but during the, the, the early, the eighties, the nineties, it was really well in like food subsidy. Right. So that was my father's job. Right. And not wow. even only that, the big the big export for Malawi was tobacco. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my father was like on, on, ahead on that. And then when he actually did that, then he went into property development. So like, you know, he, he started like, uh, you know, developing properties and all of that. And him and his um, uncle in laws, which is my 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 mother's uh, my mother's uncle, who he made a, a good money. Right, and uh, they 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 had like uh, a big a, a, a big structures that you know like uh, they even made them into um, schools like just a free school for kids to go and actually learn free education. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, like yeah. Uh, they okay. yeah, like, like he did quite a lot. Like he did quite a lot. <laughs> That's why oh, when so I was able to be at his funeral, and then for so many people. To come up yeah. and you'd never heard. He had a similar experience actually with my granddad. He was a very sweet, shy, sensitive man. And then when he mm. passed away, all the people came forward with these stories of how much he had positively impacted, you know, their lives. And he had a very quiet, gentle way of doing it as well. So it's amazing, isn't it? Like that it wasn't about the praise or for him or the or the attention. It was about doing the right thing for the right reason. <laughs> no, it wasn't yeah. like, it, it like my, like what I've said to you, like my father was very pompous, mm -hmm. right? So when he's doing his okay. thing, for somebody that doesn't know him, he will take him like, oh, he's like a boost and like what? But he had a big heart and he had a soft heart. Mm -hmm. But what big he heart. always teaches you yeah. is, don't let anybody put you on the corner, right? Be the person that you are. Be a kind person mm -hmm. and even yeah. appreciate what you do because just to be mm. able to achieve something even people they can have phd doctrines they cannot have a heart of somebody that even has no education but they are a good person you know what i mean yeah, yeah. They are, mm. people like like i always tell like my father used to say that you know like i'm very educated and i'm sending mm. you to school but being educated it doesn't take ignorance out of you 
and even no. it doesn't take it doesn't make you to be a human right mm -hmm. what makes you to be a human is the heart of god that you have and the mm -hmm. thing that you can sacrifice for other people right that yeah. you yourself you'll be craving to have and my father was somebody like that my father wow. will, will swap his will swap his fa last five euro and come home and tell my mom that we don't have food for today because the five euro just just as an example my father would do that um, because of the 10 euros that i had i found a starving person on the street and i gave it to them so what are you saying at least we've got a home we've got good life but this this person doesn't have anything and yeah. like, these are some of the qualities that i have actually really adapted that even mm. like the people like i i don't even need i don't like to say much about me i don't you've actually seen my work that i'm doing here in ireland so i don't like to be like because i can feel like oh i'm doing too much while other people feel like what is she what is she talking about so i let everyone to make their own personal judgment because you can't convince mm. anyone right but for the little mm. that i've actually done mm. i know like i have my my, my father's like my 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 father's feels that even people in my friends here always tell like ellie sometimes you should be thinking about you first you know like because i think it's just like you 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 just look out of everyone but you don't know how to look after yourself you know things yeah. like that but it's and just um, for women in this though it's like it's the overgiving yeah it's the overgiving giving and giving and then if we rebalance ourselves mm -hmm. The healthy masculine, the warrior within yeah. you, and the god who also needs to really self care is so important, especially when with you, especially with activism, Ellie. Like it's, it's crucial. I'm glad you spent the day, the day today, just resting and relaxing and being yeah. the goddess that you are. And listen, I but, think we're running a little bit behind schedule, so but, have to, you got one more yeah. thing to share. Yeah, but well, one thing, one thing that I have kept it strongly in my mind, and that my father always said is be authentic be real yeah. right when you are so real when you are so authentic yeah. it doesn't take you to convince someone it doesn't take you to write a long paper yeah. to give to someone to say like look this is no 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 you just <sighs> sit in front of <laughs> you, you just sit in front of everyone and mm -hmm. people will just read you and just be comfortable mm -hmm. everyone will be comfortable with you right be, 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 because and that's something that my father like what i'm saying like my father was a poster but he was real right so people used yeah. to like him because they used to call him uncle c because my father was cremant right so and they used to call him uncle cj right <laughs> so, <laughs> so like people would be like oh uncle cj oh is that? But, but you get what i'm saying <laughs> And we loved him we loved him that yeah. that lead. and then just a little bit of my uncle so my uncle he's a guy that um really uh brought me after my, my 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 dad and my mom and dad like we lost them uh very nice quiet guy like you know he's a doctor and you know like you saw him like mm -hmm. sitting with his kids and all of that right mm -hmm. and uh, you know a man full of wisdom like really full mm -hmm. of wisdom, so much love. And like this morning when I, when I put his picture with my dad and he said, you know, you've made me cry because he's the only one left, like only one, like only, only one left, like around my family. It's very sad that mm -hmm. <laughs> you go like, um, you know, I went to Malawi after living for a long time in direct provision. And, you know, like I went home and I went in every estate that, my family lived and you go through like in these big houses and they're empty. They're like just being washed by guards or, you know, like home take home, like people that take care of homes and stuff like that. It's sad to watch and it's really sad for, I feel sad for him too, because he lost his wife like two years ago too. And, uh, and, uh, like, uh, I, I'm sorry, like going emotion and, you know, and to see him that he, he really looks after us. Like we are still babies and that's how he just want to, he tries so hard because he knows that we like, I've never uh, grieved for my dad. Right. 
I've never grieved for my dad. And I wanted today to be about him, like not about me. Like, but I have never grieved about my dad because like just a lot of things happened, you know, and to to where I am right really now. So my uncle Lily understand that fact really well that we all never like really grieved for all this past year. So and he rang me and I was just like, and when he rang me and I cried when he just rang me and he said, you know, like I knew, I knew that's why I had to actually call you because I knew that you'd be, you'd be this way. But you know what? Like I'm here and you know, like they all love you. Like despite all of them, they've gone. Yeah. But they all love you they all love us. And then, and then we laughed, we went back and we laughed and I was like, yeah, he was here. He was here two weeks ago. Like this guy, he's so pompous. <laughs> he can come, he can, yeah, he can come in his death and, you know, like he can come in his death and start waking you up. <laughs> you know? So yeah, so that's about my dad. Like that's about Lily, my dad, CJ. I miss him so much. Um, like, yeah, but he was really a very good man. Yeah, and it's even to it's sad to see today. Like I was going through Twitter and to see other people, you know, the way the the situation that they've been with their dad, like falling out with their dad. Things shouldn't be like that, you know. Like our fathers are special people that bring us into this world and our mothers carry us, you know, and then, you know, like when our mothers brought us to this world, our fathers would be the first people like to hold us and to, to like, have you seen my baby? You know, like things like that. And it, it, they're such important people in this world. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's just unfortunate that some people go through hard situation with, with their fathers and we should be calling ourselves lucky to have these, memories of our dads you know and yeah, really, really. Yeah. you're so blessed you know and to have yeah. so many other figures in your life as well you know really strong yeah. men you have yeah. a son as well of course too don't you yeah i have a son mm-hmm. who i have to be honest he's a copycat of my dad i don't know if you've <sighs> seen him recently like now has he's growing up he looks my he looks like my dad and the funny thing Aww. is like we are yeah. so close, very close. Oh, when I mean yeah. close, like I'm very, very, I've got a strong bond with her. My daughter, she's an, uh, she's an introvert, right? So she's kind of like someone that we know how to deal with her, but she's also, she's like my dad too, because she's well off academic. Like she's mm-hmm. going into her third year now, she's studying law. So like, right, uh, right. You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And my my son just go into architecture, which is like the things that he's doing. He's kind of like buying a little sense of my dad. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, oh, that's so and that's yeah. isn't that beautiful to have that? Like to see that to see your father in your children. Like it's just yeah. such a gift. And yeah. I never even like had that conversation of like because I don't pressurize my kids. Like to be honest, yeah. I grew up in a very sure. environment whereby my parents never give me headache. They wanted me yeah. to be who I am, right? Isn't that they, a gift though? That's quite rare as well. Cause like we have that yeah. in our family too. Like my parents never pressurize us, never told us to study. And the, and it's a big culture in Ireland. Like you should be a doctor if you've got high grades or physio, yeah. pharmacy, that's really a law. And the irony is they actually have two doctors. My brother's gonna graduate from medical school next year. My, my sister's trained to be a surgeon. And I'm the wild child, I'm the eldest. Mm-hmm. The Would you believe yeah. it? There you go. But this, and it makes such a difference when you can step into your own boots and be who you really are, you know, find your way, make your mistakes, it's healthy. Exactly. Yeah. Like my, my father was exactly like that. You know, like we mm. started, we, they started sending us away to study, right? Before even yeah. we got where we are. That's why I always cry. Like I always sometimes beat myself cry because it has even taken me a very long time, man, I'll be honest with you, to accept where I am and what I've been through. And that's what breaks yeah. me all the time because I always feel like if my dad was just in front of me, he couldn't let this happen to me. You get what no. I'm saying? He, he couldn't let us go through whatever we've been through. Right, so that's what that's what made me to. But my father started like sending us like where if there was something like an opportunity where, but he knew that okay, if my kids could grab this and it's gonna make them well, and if you're not happy with it, he was okay with that. And what next? What can I do next for you? 
right? You know, like he gave yeah. us those chances, which is rare, yeah. right? Yeah. He, he never pressurized us like to yeah. to say, like, do, I was well, I was a very clever child when I was growing up and I was doing well in school. I never like had any problems in my education and stuff like that, right? So I was really, really doing well academically and I've really done well academically. And even now, if I really want to go and do my master's and do my PhD, I, I, I'll be okay to actually do that. You know what I mean? And he was like, okay, you do everything in your own time, the time you wanted to do. And he teach me both. And he also teach me like, successfully he teach me the morals of being who i am and adding mm -hmm. up the education that i can actually get and also mm -hmm. make sure that i'm also hard working so i wouldn't even complain yeah. and i wouldn't even be threatened by anyone which yeah. that's another value that i commend myself that i've really cut because i don't get threatened by anyone you know what i mean like this is me there'll always be eli kisyombe that's me and there'll always be one path that Eli Kisyom will travel. That's my path, right? Yeah. The only thing I can do is to bring in everyone in that path and make mm -hmm. sure that we all have a space in it and yeah. we can get along. And that's how I see this world. You know what I mean? <laughs> so Classic. I mean, that's so powerful. And I can I think it's such a tribute actually to how much we all love our fathers that our event is probably gonna go over an hour over time at this rate, actually. <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah. That's, that's the sheer love and the the stories and like, but it's, and it's so important. Melanie, what I believe in this world, you get the energy you give out. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You get the energy you give out. If you give out the energy that's not the energy that you have, but you just want to give that energy, you get exactly what it is—the same energy. Yeah. Oh, if I'm you. Yeah, but if you give the energy that's real, that's authentic, you will get the same. You won't even fight for anything. There is problems in this world. You know what I mean? There is problems in like power, racism and stuff like that. I don't like to speak about from the world of privilege. I've moved over to Ireland. I've been in direct provision. People that have come here, migrants in a many, many different ways. Like my route was a route whereby, that's why I struggle with it right now because I would have, loved if i could have come the way differently you know what i mean yeah, yeah. but it, during my time there i've made sure i've really integrated really well you know i didn't even push myself to be anywhere that i've been i've been there because there was a seat there for me and i could sit and i'm really contented you yeah. know what i mean and I've, I've really integrated myself really well got on really well with people and even for the people that I stand up and raise the issues that we raise the issues, you know? I make sure like everyone is accommodated, you know, like things like that. And sometimes I can even also feel like I'm actually doing better, you know, but maybe I'm even doing things wrong. So my, my motto every time is, every time that I've surrounded myself or I'm raising issues, I always ask people to actually give me their feedback even how they feel like, like be honest with me. How do you feel I'm handling the issues that it's not only affecting me, but it's also affecting you, right? And I also make sure that everyone has a share. And another thing is like, I don't like to take praise. That's something that I don't like in my life. I don't like to take praise. You know what I mean? I don't like people to be like, oh, you know what? Oh, yeah, if it comes, let, it, let me end it, right? But... <clears throat> I want to do everything because that's how I feel like principally it's right to be given to the world. So that's how I look at it. That's how I look at the world. I hear you, Ellie. So, that's amazing. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Listen, we're going to have to have to go to our next speaker now because we're already running. I, I can see that. Time. Because we're also, but it's, isn't it beautiful though? That like we're here on a Sunday evening and we're, telling stories into the wee hours about our dad it's just and fun figures your uncle as well so listen thanks so much we'll catch up soon yeah rest we'll up at your um, refugee now look after yeah we'll catch up like uh, yeah we'll catch up soon like